coffee, so encourage everybody to find Genesis 37, and when you found it, if you're able, please stand as we read God's Word. This morning's reading is from Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 11, and then Genesis chapter 41, verses 38 through 45. So Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and said it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. This is Genesis chapter 41, verse 38. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this? In whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot and they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah and he called him, and he gave him in marriage, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We begin this morning with Joseph's two dreams, and we'll end this morning with the beginning of the fulfillment of those dreams. Now, Mike Noel will continue on with the fulfillment of those dreams in two weeks from now as he continues this series, but we just want to start this morning with these three pairs of dreams in our passage. We We heard two of them, two of the dreams of Joseph himself in the middle of our passage this morning in a later chapter, we'll get two dreams, one from a cupbearer and one from a baker of Pharaoh's. And then finally, we'll get to two dreams of Pharaoh himself. I don't know how seriously you take your own dreams, but I was just thinking of how literature and film... uh, explores the mysterious world of our dreams. So if you're a Disney fan, you'll perhaps recognize one of the most famous Disney songs ever sung from the opening credits of Pinocchio in 1940. I don't remember this uh, in personal experience. But when you wish upon a star, 
makes no difference who you are, anything your heart desires will come to you. Like a bolt out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Or perhaps you're a baseball fan and you're thinking of the whispering voice in the field of dreams. If you build it, he will come. (laughs) And motivated by this voice and a vision, the main character, Ray, builds a baseball field in the middle of his farm in Iowa. Or perhaps your mind, like mine, goes to Narnia. You think of the voyage of the Dawn Treader. And you think of the Dawn Treader, the ship, sailing into the dark mist. And they hear a man screaming. And when they rescue him, he says, quick, turn around. You're about to, you're about to land on the island where all your dreams come true. And the crew's like, well, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to get to that island. He said, no, no, no. You don't understand. All your dreams come true. And it only takes them a few minutes to think back to some of the dreams they've had that they would not want to see lived out in truth. But the dreams in our passage, all six of them, are very different from those dreams. First of all, they are, these dreams are given by God himself to reveal his mysterious will to the people involved. So these dreams come from God. All six of these dreams predict the future. And as a part of our narrative story, all of these dreams set the course of the story, the direction of the story, and they serve as a reminder that God is the main actor in our story. God is the main character driving our story. Now we're entering the final section of the book of Genesis. We've been in our series for several months now, uh, which we're calling Right from the Start. And we've had various chapter markers along the way, and we get to one of those here in chapter 37. Uh, These are the generations of Jacob in this case. And this is the 10th and final chapter marker of these are the generations in our passage. And so we're entering into, think of this, think of all the years covered by the book of Genesis from creation all the way up to Joseph. We're entering the last generation described in the book of Genesis itself, the generation of Joseph's children, I'm sorry, of Jacob's children with Joseph. Now, Joseph, like Abraham, is going to get a whopping 14 chapters of the book of Genesis. So Abraham gets 14 chapters, Joseph gets 14 chapters, and it's one of the most recognizable stories in all of the Old Testament. It gives us fascinating insight into God's providence and God's direction of the events in men's lives and even of nations. Today, uh, we're covering from Genesis 37 to Genesis 41. That's a, that's a lot of material to cover. And that's going to cover almost or a little over 20 years of Joseph's life. So it begins in our narrative when Joseph is 17 years years old. And we'll kind of end in chapter 41 when Joseph is around 39. Now, during those years, Joseph lives out quite a variety of situations. In fact, if I just thought of this room, how many of us are between 17 and 39, and can we relate to all the massive changes that Joseph goes through. He's going to go from favored son to a household servant. He's going to go from a prisoner in prison to the second in command in one of the most powerful nations on earth at the time. Now, as I mentioned, Mike will pick up our series in two weeks and talk about the later years of Joseph's life and take a closer look at God's sovereignty in directing all these things. But what I hope that we will see today is I want us to see that God was with Joseph. In all that Joseph went through, God was with Joseph. 
We'll see that God was with Joseph in his difficulties. God was with Joseph in his temptations. God accomplishes his purposes in spite of man's sins. And God was with Joseph in his successes. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful this morning for all of the young life that was at the front of the stage. And God, even as we consider babies and grandbabies and great-grandbabies, we think of your sovereign care over our lives, and we're grateful. Lord, we are grateful that not only do you give life, but you are with us. You are with us day by day. Even as we sang about this morning of your steadfast covenant faithfulness through everything, you are with us. And Lord, I do pray this morning for those who are here and they are in a particular trial or difficulty, perhaps an extended time of difficulty. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, even in those moments. We thank you that your promises are true, that our trajectory is certain because of your faithfulness. Help us, Lord, to, like Joseph, experience your presence in all circumstances. And may that lead us to faithful trust and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first, God was with Joseph in his difficulties. Now, we're not gonna, we can't read all of these chapters, so I'm leaning in, hoping that you're a little familiar with some of Joseph's story. Um, but this narrative is going to eventually take us to significant heights of power and prestige for Joseph. But it doesn't begin that way. It begins in a very normal way. It begins with brotherly strife, family rivalry. Perhaps you have some experience with bickering siblings or bickering children. Does that relate to anyone in this room? Yes, many of us. So, so that's where our story begins, is with the story of Joseph and his brothers. Now, if you'll remember, Joseph is the 11th of 12 brothers. 11 out of 12. And he lives in a very complicated, blended family. There's one dad, four moms, 12 brothers. This is a very complicated family family. And there was lots of rivalry among the brothers. There was even rivalry among the wives. And Joseph here, we see at the beginning of our story, he's a 17-year-old lad, so he's near the bottom. Most of his siblings are older, and he's been asked to help the sons of Leah and Rachel's servants, Bilhah and Zilpah. Now, I don't feel in the story that Joseph was very excited about this task, and he brings an evil report back about these brothers. Now, we may tempted to think of our own children and how they're tattletales on their siblings, and sometimes they are, but we don't really have a reason to say that Joseph was being a tattletale, but he brought an accurate report back to Jacob, their father, and this reflected badly on four of his brothers. Now, though we hope we do hope that Jacob would have learned from his own experience as a young boy about parental favoritism. We know that Jacob's own father preferred his brother to him. It was part of his story. He didn't seem to take that to heart in his own parenting. So, so here we have Jacob with his 12 sons, Joseph being number 11. And not only is, not only is Jacob subtly you know, being subtly showing favoritism towards Joseph. No, he goes out and actually gets Joseph a completely different wardrobe to signify to everyone who can see, this is my favorite son. This is my favorite. He's the, he's the favorite one. I don't recommend this as a parenting strategy. It leads to great harm in this story. So everyone in the family knows what Joseph's position is. We see in verse 4, when his brothers saw 
that their father loved him more than all his brothers. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Eleven against one. They hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And then, and then Joseph has two dreams. Not only is he Jacob's favored son, but now it seems that he has been chosen by God himself as the one to rule over all his brothers, and even over his father and mother. Now, we do wonder at this point if Joseph is lacking in some emotional intelligence, right? Um, Now, it's not Joseph's fault that God gave him these dreams, but I don't know if God told him to share these dreams with his brothers, but he did. He shares his dreams with his brothers, and in verse 8, it says, So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So there is family strife. Joseph faces difficulties with his brothers. And then in one of the most famous episodes in the whole Old Testament, Joseph's brothers conspire against him. And their first plan was just, let's just outright kill him. Let's just kill our brother. That would show him. We'll see if his dreams can come true then. But Reuben, so he is the oldest, he thinks, you know, I... Maybe we shouldn't kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. Let's just throw him in a pit. And Reuben's thinking, I know I've kind of blown it already with dad, but maybe if I deliver Joseph back to him, I'll gain some standing. I'll use this situation for my advantage. But but they throw Joseph in the pit, and what should they do next? Well, they sit down to eat. The brothers just sit down to eat. That's what they do after they throw Joseph into a pit. And then they realize, hey, there are some traders coming by. Let's sell Joseph to them. Then we'll at least make some money out of the deal instead of just killing him outright. This is not a great, this is not a great heritage for Jacob's sons at this moment, is it? They're not proving themselves to be very worthy. So how was Joseph experiencing God's presence in the midst of his difficulties with his family? He's sold for 20 shekels of silver. But his dreams, God revealed to Joseph something that he was going to do. God met Joseph in some way through these dreams. Now, they wouldn't be fulfilled till many years later, but they were a sign that God was with him. Well, now if we turn to chapter 39... Joseph is being brought down to Egypt. The story returns to Joseph. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down, brought him down there. Verse 2, you may want to underline it. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. It's a pretty good gig for a 17-year-old, I think. And though we may think this is a pretty good gig, don't misunderstand. This is a trial for Joseph. In Potiphar's house, Joseph is living in a foreign land among foreign gods, away from his family. He's not free. He has no rights. As we'll soon see, he is beset with temptations daily and eventually removed from his post as quickly as he gets it through lies and injustice. So he has difficulties in his slavery. But he also has difficulties in prison. Now, we know Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery. We know he was 30 when he rises to power in Egypt. We don't know in those 14 years how many were in Potiphar's house and how many were in prison. We know at least two of them were in prison. 
But as I read it, I think more of it might have been in prison than that. But we don't actually know. But let's read in 39, beginning in verse 19. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. I mean, could Moses have been clearer about the significance of the fact that God was with Joseph? Wherever Joseph goes, the Lord is with him. Now, that doesn't mean that Joseph always knew the Lord was with him, or that Joseph always felt that the Lord was with him, or that Joseph always had the confidence that the Lord was with him. But Moses is telling us what was actually true in all of those moments. The Lord was with Joseph. We don't know if Joseph was aware that this is the way, this is the way that the dreams that God gave me are going to come to reality. We don't know if Joseph thought that about his dreams at this time. What we, what we can think is that it seems like a detour. It seems like a detour. Joseph had these dreams of how God was going to lift him up. And all of these things have happened. In the middle of his 20s, teen years and 20s, that don't seem to be leading to what he dreamed about. So I'm not sure if this has ever happened to you, but I came across a detour recently. It was after a long day at work, and I'm heading home, and I'm anticipating a warm, home-cooked meal, an orderly house, a warm welcome when I get home. Traffic was bad. Traffic was bad, and as usual, All the people on the Highway 55 bypass are driving 12 miles per hour below the speed limit. (laughs) And I get through all that city stuff, and I get to the country roads that I really actually enjoy. I'm a rural boy, after all. So I get on the country roads. I'm I'm just minutes away from home. I'm on the stretch of Andrew Road, and all of a sudden, wham, the road is blocked. There's been a traffic accident. It's completely shut down. Now, there's no side road to just skirt around that. Oh, no. I've got to go back several miles, drive back through Fuquay, Verena, and the traffic there. I'm realizing I shouldn't have just chugged that whole water bottle before I left work. (laughs) So I get home. You know, I I don't remember what was for dinner that night. I'm sure it was good. Don't remember if the house was in order. Actually... I took those things for granted. What I remember was the detour. I did not appreciate the detour. I remember how much it threatened my joy. I mean, this is such a silly thing, isn't it? How much it threatened my joy, these 14 minutes of inconvenience. Yet Joseph just faced 14 years 14 years of trials and uncertainty and difficulty. Yet we don't see him complain. We don't see him question God. What we hear is the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph not only in the destination to where he's headed, but in, in the detour. The Lord was with him. And friends, whatever whatever detour you feel you're experiencing right now, the Lord is with you in that.
So the Lord was with Joseph in his difficulty. Second, God was with Joseph in his temptations. Now we're going to go back to Potiphar's house in chapter 39 again. And I'm sure in Potiphar's house, he encountered various kinds of difficulty. And often when we think of sufferings and difficulties, we think of those things that come from the outside and make our life uncomfortable. We think of sickness or slander or hunger or strife. But friend, temptation, temptation is one of the biggest difficulties that we face. And God was with Joseph in his temptations. Temptations highlight our own weaknesses and our own failures. And Joseph is a great example for us. Look in verse 6 of chapter 39. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of my master, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he's put everything that is in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day... When he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Now, perhaps Joseph could have given in to her temptation and not been found out by Potiphar. Perhaps Joseph could have gone along with the loose sexual morality of the culture. Perhaps it would have been understandable for Joseph to give in since Potiphar's wife was a very powerful person and in a position to do him harm if he dismissed her advances. But the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph, and perhaps this is the greatest thing, to strengthen us in the midst of temptations. The Lord was with Joseph. Now, what do I mean by the Lord was with Joseph in his temptations? What I mean is God was in Joseph's thoughts. Joseph was living quorum deo. He was living before the face of God. He knew that it would be a sin against Potiphar, but also a sin against God, even more a sin against God. It reminds me of Psalm 51, 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Friend, our moments of temptation are when we feel when we feel that God is the farthest away. We convince ourselves God is not here. God does not see. God does not care. But one of our greatest helps in temptation is to realize God is with us, that he sees, that he cares it seems somewhat childish, but I actually find this really helpful. Would you do the thing you're about to do if Jesus were sitting next to you? That's just a childish way to think about it, but it's so helpful. Would you watch that movie? Would you, would you post that biting word on social media? Would you mislead that customer? Would you yell in anger at your spouse or your children? If Jesus were right next to you, 
if we really consider God's presence, if we really understand who God is, that we know God is present with us. And his presence matters. If, if you really considered God's presence, would you choose the right thoughts, the right words, the right actions? Because God is with you. Turn with me to Psalm 139, if you don't mind. This is just so helpful for us to consider how God is with us in temptation. Read the first 12 verses. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. One of our greatest helps in temptation is to remember that God is with us. The Lord was with Joseph, and he remembered in the midst of his temptation that the Lord was with him, and he fled. He risked losing everything again by obeying God. He was willing to risk everything rather than transgress against his God. There is much we can learn from his response. He was steadfast. He was decisive. He was willing to face consequences for his obedience. But our passage does give us a contrast to Joseph's faith-filled obedience. So quickly, I want us to consider chapter 38. So God accomplishes his purposes in spite of man's sins. Now, I hope if you've been with us through our journey through Genesis that you've seen and recognized that the Bible doesn't overlook the flaws of its characters. Now, if the Bible were just something made up by man you would think that it would kind of gloss over or sugarcoat the the faults of its characters. But that's not true in the Word of God. God is very honest and forthcoming about the fallenness of the characters in the story. We've seen it over and over again. From our first parents, Adam and Eve, God has not limited himself to working with perfect people. This is a mark of the Bible's authenticity. But there are moments, there are moments still when we open the Bible and we encounter an in-your-face depravity which God overcomes by His grace that surprises us. And if you're familiar with these chapters of Scripture, you might be wondering, like, are we going to skip over chapter 38 or not? You see, if chapter 38 were a movie, you wouldn't let your kids watch it. But it's important that we, we consider why Moses included chapter 38 in the story. Look at verses 1 and 2. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. And there Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in to her. Now, at that time, the opening words there refers back to the end of chapter 37, 
when Joseph had been sold into slavery and his father believed that he had been killed and refused to be comforted, continuing to mourn for days and months and said he was going to mourn until he went to the grave to be with Joseph. Pretty difficult family dynamics here. Consider all the sideways glances of the brothers who knew what had really happened. So Judah gets out of town. He gets out of town. And so this chapter is telling the same timeline in Judah's life while Joseph is in Potiphar's house, in prison, in the first few years of his reign in Egypt under Pharaoh. There's a contrast here, no doubt. Joseph with his self-control and discipline and the presence of God and Judah seeming to abandon all of those things. So why do we need to know what's going on in Judah's life at all? Well, one, because the promised Messiah ultimately is going to come through Judah and not through Joseph. We need to know. So we're not going to hear what's happening to all of the other brothers, but But for Judah, this is important because through Jacob, the promise is going to come for a Messiah through someone, and that someone, in this case, is going to be Judah. He's the fourth son, so why him? Because Reuben already forfeited his birthright by laying with his father's wife. Simeon and Levi forfeited their birthright because they committed violence against Shechem, and Judah's next in line. And the kingly line will come through Judah. So through Joseph, Jacob's family is going to be rescued from famine. And through Joseph's actions, the people of God will be saved through that famine and then be delivered from Egypt in a powerful way that brings God's glory into view. But through Judah will come the promised Messiah, who's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But this chapter describes this. It describes this. This is the simplest way to say it. Judah began living like a Canaanite. He saw a woman he thought was attractive. He took her. He had three children, two of whom were so wicked that it says that God killed them for how wicked they were. First people in the Bible that it, by name, and God killed him because of his wickedness. After Judah's wife died, he went into his daughter-in-law. Got her pregnant, thinking she was a prostitute. He was ready to have her burned because of her sins when he realized that that had happened. Then he realized he was the one. Sordid story. Remember, the Bible doesn't hide the flaws of its characters. Instead, the Bible is a story of redemption and reconciliation and repentance and restoration. So the story doesn't end there. We have some reason to believe that Judah repented. First, in Genesis 38, verse 26, he eventually acknowledges that Tamar is more righteous than he. And he allows the twins to be born, which will be in the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1, 3. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. So right there in in Matthew's gospel, highlighting a moment of terrible, sinful depravity that God redeemed, that God used. We also have reason to believe that Judah repented because later in the narrative, Judah's going to speak up in some helpful ways to his brothers and his father. Mike will cover some of that ground in a few weeks. But whatever, it's abundantly emphasized in this chapter that God's story is a story of redemption, that his redemptive plans are not thwarted by man's sins. So God was with Joseph in his difficulties. God was with Joseph in his temptations. God was working things out even through man's sins. And finally, God was with Joseph in his successes. Turn to chapter 41. Things are about to change for Joseph. For the last 14 years, he's been in slavery or in prison, but God has been with him. 
God has been with him in his difficulties and through his temptations. And God again acts in his providence and intervenes to change the course of history by giving two dreams to Pharaoh. Just, just think of that. Think of, think of how God is over all creation and how at this moment God steps in and changes the course of history by giving two dreams to Pharaoh. Look in verse 8, chapter 41. So, in the morning, his spirit was troubled, this is Pharaoh, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all his wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed the same night, he and I, each having his own dream with its interpretation. And a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. And when we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. And then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when, they had shaved, when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. It all happens so fast. Much like Joseph's previous changes in position, from favored son to near death sold into slavery, from favored servant over the entire household to condemned prisoner, Again, changes quickly. Why? Why does it change? Because God intervened and gave Pharaoh two dreams. And so Pharaoh says to Joseph in verse 15, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Notice Notice how quickly Joseph points to God, because remember, God is with Joseph. He knows where the power and wisdom come from. Look down at verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 28. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God. God will shortly bring it to pass. So what is God doing? God is revealing and God is acting. Joseph has a crystal clear picture of God's providence over all things. God's providence means that Things do not happen by random or chance or by determination or fate. He is personally, actively working through his creation to bring about his purposes. We see this in what Joseph is claiming. God has revealed what he's about to do. So God is foretelling something in the future and God is determining what will happen. But what does Pharaoh see in all this? What does he hear? Verse 37, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. God had prepared Joseph for this moment. God had prepared Joseph through difficulty, through temptations, through trials, through betrayals. He prepared him. And we must not think that we can enter into this moment that Joseph is experiencing with Pharaoh being lifted up being exalted to a position of power and authority, that that's the moment when we're going to really shine and live for God. Oh, no. 
Joseph began that with his brothers. He began that when he was serving Potiphar. He began that in prison. There's one more bit of evidence showing Joseph's continued awareness of God's presence and blessing, and it's in the naming of his son. So now he's been out of the house, out of his father's house, nearly 20 years, immersed in the paganism of Egypt. But when his sons are born, he names them as a way to call attention to God's covenant faithfulness. Verse 51, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Verse 52, and the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. God was with Joseph The Bible warns us against prosperity as a measure of God's faithfulness. In Proverbs 30, Solomon says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Be careful in wishing for prosperity. In fact, we must learn the secret of abounding as well as going without. Paul in Philippians 4, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So where are you this morning? How are you approaching Joseph's story? How are you identifying with Joseph? Are you like Joseph facing difficulties, perhaps a season of difficulties? We've already heard this promise spoken this morning. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now that, you may know that from from the book of Hebrews, which is a great place, but most likely quoted from the book of Joshua. So think, Joshua Joshua's about to lead the Israelites back into Canaan to conquer it, facing many foes, facing many hardships and difficulties. And in Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Why? Why should we not be frightened or dismayed? Is it because we're sure that we'll be victorious in the moment? No. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, the Lord is with you. What should Christians expect? We see what happened in Joseph's life, the hardships. It's It's kind of convenient to read over 20 years of his life in an hour. Imagine that 20 years felt longer for him. But as Christians, what should we anticipate or expect? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Indeed, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test of time, he will receive the crown of life for which God has promised to those who love him. Are you like Joseph? facing temptation. Remember that God is present with you. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. You hear the... You hear the echoes of Joseph? Flee. 
Are you perhaps not identifying with Joseph this morning, but you're identifying with Judah in his wrecked life, wondering, can I be included in God's plan? Perhaps your story feels more like Judah's than Joseph's at this point. That's okay. God's story is a story of redemption. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus said, I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Our hope is not in Pinocchio's fate or the whispering of a deceased ball player. We don't dread that our nightmares are going to come true. Our hope is in another, like Joseph, who suffered for wrongs he did not commit. He was convicted unjustly and punished, even put to death for the sins of others. He did this willingly for you and me. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And like Joseph, he was raised up to power, but not just to be second in command in Egypt but to sit at the right hand of God the Father. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But that one that's ruling and reigning and who will come again is with us. God was with Joseph, and God is with us. Even even in a new, increased way, behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are with us. Whether we feel it in the moment or not, we believe it. We believe it because of your promises. We believe it because of your character. We believe it because of who Jesus is. We believe it because the Spirit has been given to your children. So, Lord, whatever detour we feel we are in of difficulty or temptation or failure, Lord, would your Holy Spirit awaken us and open our eyes to see that you are indeed with us and we can call upon your name for forgiveness. We can call upon your name for strength. We can call upon your name for power to live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.